Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our next session of Automation Days Asia. In this next session, we're going to talk about learning, and we're going to be talking about how do you upskill for artificial intelligence and automation in 2023. It's a topic that we have been talking about quite a bit over the last two days, a lot about learning programs and the need for education in artificial intelligence and uh, automation. With me today, I have Nico Bitzer, who's dialing in from Germany and who is a co-founder and CEO of Bots and People, the digital upskilling provider for automation, AI, and low-code technology, serving the world's leading corporate brands. The mission of Bots and People is to make way for meaningful work for everyone by empowering people to get rid of repetitive tasks through process automation. Before founding Bots and People in 2020, Nico gathered many years of experience in digital transformation consulting at PwC, and he has an extensive knowledge in areas such as AI and automation technologies, learning and development, and digital empowerment. Nico is a convinced humanist and has repeatedly proven his dedication to helping people thrive, including by working as a volunteer coach for social initiatives and impact startups. Founded in 2020, People and Bolts and People is an automation enablement startup with a mission to banish repetitive tasks and make way for meaningful work for everyone by enabling companies to master process automation internally. Nico, it's your first time at Automation Days Asia. I'm super excited to have you, and I really look forward to your presentation. Floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jan. What an introduction. I'm really happy about this. And also just some words about my background. So no need to congratulate me to my birthday. It was just a birthday a few days ago of my uh, fiance. Um, I will talk today about uh, how you do upskilling for AI and automation right in 2023, pro probably also still in 2024. So it will, it will last a while. Um, the presentation is, is split in three parts. So first of all, we will go through why upskilling for those topics is so important nowadays. Then um, I will um, explain about the common pitfalls uh, of um, automation and AI upskilling and what can go wrong and what can you communicate wrong to the organization. And then in the third part, we will also go through some practical uh, tips on how to implement an upskilling approach for those topics. Uh, also, we'll come to uh, uh, comparing upskilling and reskilling, which is um, sometimes uh, mixed up terms. And I will um, clarify what we mean with upskilling exactly um, and then um, go into the practical tips. We will make that interactive. I know I can't see you, um, but um, I will uh, watch the chat and um, ask some questions in between. And you can use it to reflect a little bit, uh, to keep uh, engaged. And I would be also happy if you use the chat and interact with me via this. So first of all, um, I have brought two pictures uh, for you, and I want you to think about for a moment what those two pictures could have in common. And you can also use the chat to already write into the chat. What do you see and what does it have in common? Right. So what you see here on the right side is um, the upper picture shall show a tailor surgeon. So someone who can um, uh, operate a surgery uh, from uh, somewhere else. So um, I think the first uh, tailor surgery was conducted just a few um, years ago and someone from um, Japan um, uh, operated someone from the US so it's really uh, possible to do that, but only um, uh, from the last couple of years. It was not possible before, and it's only possible through, through, uh, through 5G technology. Then on the lower picture, you see um, an esports event, and also esports, those are um, jobs that occurred around esports only a few years ago. It was not existent. A uh, whole industry was not existent just uh, 10, 20 years ago, it just arised. And what it, what it has in common is um, that these jobs are pretty fair and new. And if you look um, at a statistic from the World Economic Forum, um, it's that 65% uh, of kids that go to elementary school right now will have jobs in future that do not exist 
right now. And I found that a super impressive number. So it's two thirds um, of all uh, kids going to elementary schools, which shows how the world is changing at the moment. We see esports um, uh, arising, we see telesurgeons arising, but uh, the rest what will still arise, we cannot even imagine in the next couple of years. What do you think? Um, probably someone brought it into the presentation as well in the last one or two days, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I want to see your uh, guesses, how many percent of work activities could already be automated. And I think there's a couple of different, yeah, 50% I see from Jamila, 55%. So even in the newest uh, McKinsey uh, study, uh, we can also uh, share it um, in the show notes, let's say, um, it was even 70%. And what was the most interesting uh, part for me is, that um, just 2017, they um, published um, a research around um, how many work activities can be automated, and it was 50%. And this year, in June, they brought out a paper for the economical impact of generative AI, and then it already rised to seven to up to 70% of work activities just with just uh, with the innovation um, and the boom of generative AI because <clears throat> that's disrupting massively the automation market again. And so now we can wonder ourselves, we have all this super great uh, technologies in our companies. We all uh, bought um, licenses for um, the automation software. We all um, have a, a lot of modern technology that sits in the cloud in the companies. But still, the employee skills um, on a broader level are missing to really make use of that technologies. Because if you could automate 70%, um, then um, the hypothesis is that just the skills are missing to make really use of this huge potential. And then <clears throat> I want you to <clears throat> take another guess. Um, so it's 86% uh, of people in the world can read, write, and count. So what do you think? How many people in the world can code, writing, writing software code? You can see the first 5%. 5%, 21%, Emily, that's super optimistic. Actually, it's just 0.3%. Um, and I found that also a super impressive number. That's why I brought it. Um, because it's it's a it's a very little people in the world can actually code. And then now you could wonder, okay, if the technology is there to automate 70% of work activities, um, but only 0 0.3% percent of people can code and use that technology, then we just need to educate more uh, software developers, right? Just need to make people um, learn Python, and then the world will be a better one. But they, uh, actually, it's super hard to train someone who is currently an accountant or a controller in the finance department or someone working in procurement to be a Python developer. It takes uh, several years. Uh, Volkswagen, one of the biggest uh, corporates in the world, um, it's a, uh, the German automotive company. They have, for example, a whole academy called Faculty 73, where they educate uh, people um, that um, have jobs that get automated into being software developer. But it takes three years to reskill someone into that role. So that's why, um, from my perspective, there is another um, uh, opportunity we have in the world at the moment, uh, which is um, citizen development. I guess many of you heard um, already uh, uh, about citizen development. What is it? Citizen development is when someone in a, a business department like finance or procurement learns on how to build technical solutions without coding skills and without also the background knowledge of being a software developer. 
And with that, we have also a huge chance to make use of that 70% automation potentials to educate people using the technology without even being software developers. <clears throat> so uh, to summarize this, um, in the old world, we were focus on, focused on writing code um, and we were always in need for software developers and had a very centralized IT landscape. Um, especially in, in Europe, a lot of people, a lot of uh, companies using um, SAP, but um, I think it doesn't, um, it's not a big difference to other big C um, ERP systems. So usually in a big corporate, you would have an ERP team that takes care of this um, core software. And then if someone from the business has an idea to change something, has an idea to improve something on a process, they would need to go to that um, central um, IT team and they would ask for an improvement. And then this will take several months or even years to prioritize and implement. Now with the automation teams, it gets uh, bridged a little bit. So you can also go to the uh, RPA team or the automation team to uh, implement um, such things uh, in a faster way. And in, even in the future, uh, with the focus on low-code and AI, uh, with the focus on um, a software like, for example, Microsoft Power Platform, which is implemented in almost every organization, um, we can have now the opportunity to educate people uh, and business user in those technologies, being citizen developer and democratize the IT landscape. Um, this has not only the advantage of um, being uh, faster in uh, implementing improvements, but also make use of the domain knowledge of the people in their departments. And this um, is uh, a huge thing for companies because it brings more efficiency and speed in upskilling. It's more cost effective than uh, educating people to software developers. Uh, it will lead to a more democratized IT landscape. And also it will lead to uh, being a future-proof organization. One last uh, statistic, then I'm also done, I think, with the statistics. But uh, next year, um, uh, there will be a point, it's according to Gartner, that 65% of all software um, will be developed already as low-code solutions. So if you, um, as a company, do not invest in um, educating people to use this, those low-code technologies, you cannot make use um, uh, of this and you will still rely to your central um, IT landscape. So now um, we know why it is so important to upskill people uh, in uh, AI and low code and process automation. And now we can uh, get to the four common pitfalls of automation initiatives and also how to communicate automation initiatives. The first one is to just uh, focus on technology instead of humans. Um, you can imagine um, like focusing on technology instead of humans, that would be like uh, driving in a supermarket, buying a hammer in the supermarket, and then looking at home where I can hit on with this hammer. Where do I have something I can use my hammer? But this is not the way uh, you should uh, think of it. The way you should think of it is um, identifying an issue in the company, identifying an issue at home, and then drive to the supermarket and buy the tools you need to solve that uh, issue. And the same with automation technologies, it's important to uh, look into it, to evaluate it, but it's um, much more important to look on where you need it and why you and, and what kind of technology is the best suitable for your um, challenges. And uh, um, another um, uh, another thing I want to um, uh, give you on the way. Uh, is this Iron Man analogy. And I, I want you to also use the chat and um, uh, tell me what has Iron Man to do with automation. I will give you a moment. You can either reflect for yourself or you can use the chat to tell me. No idea. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Ah, the picture is, is AI. Yeah. 
Uh, Ivy, that goes into the right direction. So what is an Iron Man suit? The Iron Man suit is a technology. But still, there is a human inside uh, the suit. So if the technology can be great, the Iron Man suit can be great. But if you aren't trained to use it um, or you use it for a bad purpose, you are not a superhero anymore. You are more a danger for the world. And the same is with um, uh, AI automation and low-code technologies. If you use it for the wrong purpose, um, if you are not trained to use it, you can damage the corporation instead of helping it. But if you are trained and you have a good intention and you know what to do, you can be a superhero um, for your organization. Then the first point, uh, the, the, the second uh, pitfall um, for um, rolling out automation initiatives is uh, to prioritize the skeptic people. Um, there is a lot of companies where we work with that say, okay, but we need to convince this stakeholder and this uh, guy really needs to commit to our initiative. Uh, otherwise, it won't work. And what are we doing with the people always complaining? But that will make your initiative stuck. And that's why um, we always recommend to start with the pioneers, with the people that really want to change, that really want to um, adapt uh, to the new um, technologies instead of focusing to also make the ones enthusiastic that are too skeptical. And um, there is a great uh, YouTube video called um, The First Follower Principle. Um, you can see it on the uh, pictures on the right side of the slide. Um, there is someone, uh, a naked person, basically dancing in a park and looks um, a little bit uh, stupid. Uh, so the dancing is not really accurate and uh, the people um, looking um, confused to that person. And then after a while, a second person is joining and they dance together and they already uh, look uh, less uh, stupid because they are already a small group. And then the group gets bigger and bigger. And in the end, um, the whole park is dancing and just a few, few people are sitting on the floor. And now those people are looking uh, a little stupid and not the ones dancing. And what I want to tell you with this analogy is the same is um, in your um, organization. There is some people that start a movement, some people that start um, uh, educating in low code or automation technologies. And then in the beginning, because they do something different uh, to the organization, um, they might look um, a little uh, weird for the others and it takes a lot of courage and enthusiasm and uh, resistance for that people to continue doing that uh, and to push through the change and it's special persons you need to find for the initiative then the number three is that fte savings are the main goal so of course it's important uh, to have um, uh, also more efficiency through automation, but uh, automation can do so much more. Um, it can lead to a higher uh, employee satisfaction. It can lead to a higher customer satisfaction. It can also um, bridge um, compliance risk and not only the FTE savings. If you really only look at the FTE savings, that's also not appealing for the uh, employees because of, obviously it's not their main goal to reduce the FTEs, but rather to ease th their work. Um, I have one example from a company um, we worked with. They implemented a four-day uh, work week for the whole um, organization. It's, it was an organization with 10,000 employees. Um, and then um, they built a storyline around, hey, we can do this four-day work week, but only if we get more efficient and if we um, implement uh, more automation. And I found that uh, pretty appealing for the employees to then also join the movement and learn about automation. Then the number four is that um, uh, many believe that automation is a silver bullet and can now solve every challenge and every issue. Um, uh, in school, back in school, my math teacher always said that the calculator we're using is an idiot, uh, but a highly gifted idiot. And same with uh, current automation technologies and um, also even with um, generative AI. 
So it can do a lot and it's super impressive what it can do, but it cannot do uh, everything for sure. And it cannot uh, replace in most of the cases a full employee. So here um, I brought an example uh, of um, a, a financial and investment analyst and how many percentage of the job of a financial investment analyst can be automated. It's 45%, which is already a lot, but only 45%. You can find those uh, statistics uh, on uh, a, a website called Will Robots Take My Job? Uh, dot com and there you can type in job titles and you can see the automation potential of uh, every job profile it's um, super interesting and uh, you will see that uh, almost no job has a automation potential higher than uh, 50 or 60 percent um, and that shows that always this 40 percent um, at least shows the domain expertise uh, of the person and will still be super relevant for the organization. You cannot just uh, fire an accountant or a controller because you automated the job of the person. No, you need the controller or the accountant to use automation technology to be an accountant or controller uh, of the future and a modern one to using new technologies. The number to this is that only 5% worldwide occupations can be entirely automated using existing technology. So it's a really uh, small uh, number. And here's another visualization. So you see on the left side, you see the jobs. I, I know it's a bit abstract, but I explain it as good as I can. Uh, on the left side, you can see the jobs and the light purple is the activities that cannot be automated. The dark purple ones is the ones that can be automated. And then you would implement a robot or an automation or a workflow or a generative AI use case or whatever you name it, um, which is the dark purple on the right side. And then you free up time. This is the yellow boxes uh, of the um, jobs of the people and they can then focus on more meaningful work. To summarize the second part of the presentation, uh, what are the uh, common pitfalls of rolling out automation initiatives and what you can do better? I turn it around and I give three major uh, advices on how you can do it. The first one is to take the people on board and give them time to learn. Um, think of the Iron Man suit. The second thing is to focus on the champions and visionaries to be faster in rolling out your um, communication and automation initiative. And the third thing is to understand the capabilities, but also the limitations of technology. And now we come to um, the practical tips and tricks on how you can think of upskilling for process automation and AI. Um, and I um, uh, like to use the uh, golden circle uh, for this. The golden circle is the uh, why, how, what um, approach from, from Simon Sinek, and we borrowed it uh, for automation uh, upskilling. So first of all, it's super important to ask uh, yourself, why do I want to um, upskill for those technologies? What are the business goals you want to achieve and how you want to measure this? And here, as said in the presentation before, it shouldn't be only FTE savings or being more efficient, but uh, look uh, into the goals of the C-level of your company. Look what they want to achieve at the moment and then map your um, automation goals, but also your upskilling goals to that main company goals, because that will back up your initiative towards the um, upper management. Uh, and it will help you um, getting the buy-in to make the initiative um, big and also to make it relevant to the organization. Also one um, example and one uh, tip on how you can also talk about um, FTE saving, uh, which makes much more sense, would be the term uh, giving hours back to the business, uh, which you can measure the same way and it's a much nicer storyline. Then uh, what can you do now to um, upskill people for um, uh, automation, AI, and low-code? Um, then you need to think about what learning goals need to be achieved by the learners. 
uh, and a learning goal is not, um, for example, the um, they learn how to use low code. That's not a learning goal. A learning goal is, uh, for example, um, a learner is able to implement a Microsoft Power App, for example. So it's, it should be very concrete, measurable, um, so that you can ask the learner after the learning initiative, are you confident to implement a Power App? Are you confident to identify an automation potential? These would be um, relevant learning goals. And then also you should think of what are the competencies that are relevant to achieve that learning goals. Um, and a, a competency basically is what uh, brain capacity do you have? What um, skill do you have to achieve then um, the learning goal? And we also brought some examples on what's important nowadays. For example, low-code programming, process management, AI impact, RPA or process mining. Um, many companies uh, nowadays want to uh, ask us, hey, can you roll out a generative AI learning initiative? Because now the whole company needs to, needs to learn how to use uh, JetGPT or the company's own GPT. Um, and they forgot um, about this uh, process element, which is super crucial to us. I will get to that a little later. And then um, uh, if you have the, learn the, the company goal, the learning goals, and uh, then you can think of how to implement uh, the learning initiatives, what learning methods fit to the needs of the employees and what formats are appropriate. Some companies uh, really um, uh, succeed with just uh, e-learning formats. Um, most of the companies um, are successful with blended learning, which is the mix of uh, live sessions, virtual live sessions, um, and uh, e-learning formats for self-learning. As uh, promised in the beginning, I also want to give you a little uh, overview on the difference of upskilling versus reskilling. Um, what we talk about in this presentation um, was uh, more towards the upskilling term because that means to um, upskill an existing job. So as, um, for example, the accountant who now learns how to do proper process management or the accountant uh, to learn how to use uh, JetGPT uh, to um, support uh, his or her job. Reskilling would be uh, to reskill someone from being an accountant to being a Python developer. And... Um, the upskilling approach is um, much broader for the relevant for the whole organization because everyone basically in the organization needs to learn basics about new technologies versus reskilling is really for people who want to change their uh, job profile. Okay, here um, I want to give you uh, an overview on what kind of topics should be in your um, upskilling portfolio uh, nowadays. Um, and you can um, uh, replace on the right side, you can replace the uh, technologies, obviously, uh, into uh, all other automation technologies. But um, what um, we would recommend is uh, using four levels, for example, saying beginner, intermediate, advanced, and expert, and then um, um, looking into training people in artificial intelligence because it's a topic right now really um, disrupting uh, the uh, automation world and the digital transformation world. But then in, at the core, and that's why it's also in the middle, the most important thing is to learn uh, about uh, process excellence and automation, getting that skills to analyze a good automation potential, to calculate a business case, and to um, work together with technical people to implement a solution. And then on the right side, uh, you would find all the citizen development tracks, uh, which, uh, as said, you can replace um, the uh, technologies with all other uh, automation technologies you are using um, at your company. This uh, symbolizes that there you train people to really get technical and to implement as citizen developer um, their own solutions. And um, you can do that in uh, three formats that were working well for us um, uh, with our uh, partners. But you can 
also, of course, uh, look into more uh, formats. That this is just what, what we can uh, recommend. Um, it's uh, to use virtual workshops um, with um, uh, combined with self-study. So you would give the learners a certain uh, amount of e-learning materials for their self-study um, to bring them on one knowledge level. And then you would go into an interactive workshop to start um, a topic. Then a second um, a format that worked really well is the cohort-based learning approach where you have um, self-learning phases alternating with um, virtual live sessions. So you have a self-study phase, then you give a homework to the learners. The learners would bring the results of their homework to the live session and then you talk uh, with a trainer about the homework. By this you don't have this um, lecture style uh, trainings where the trainer explains all the uh, contents in a session and you rather bring that into the self-learning part uh, because you can also watch it as a recording and then in the live session it's really about uh, practical uh, knowledge sharing and getting the trainer or, or coach to help you fulfilling your homework. And then uh, for um, especially technical implementations, and if it goes to the um, uh, developing your own low-code solution, developing your workflow, your RPA, um, or your uh, um, low-code app, then we would recommend an expert coaching where you really meet uh, once a week, for example, with a coach um, to um, drive your own use case and also to ask specific questions to that coach. That is also usually smaller groups um, for up to five people. The other formats can work for up to 100 people to get really huge rollouts in your organization. And how you can implement it, um, also a practical approach on how it can work. Uh, we would uh, recommend to start with a uh, set up workshop where you think about the learning goals for your initiatives. Then you clarify also, uh, please, <laughs> with, with your HR department on how you can integrate it into the learning catalog of your company, also technically, but also from a topic um, perspective. Then you can do in the background um, the trainer staffing. That's super crucial. It's just a bubble here. But of course, a good um, a training initiative uh, is only good if you have really good um, and talented trainers. And good trainers are not the same people that are technically really good. That can, can be uh, two very different uh, things. So look uh, into people that are really good in training others, really good in explaining. They don't need to be... Uh, super deep tech, but just uh, good for the level you want to train the people in. And then you would onboard the learners and start the journey. And then super important to also report it to your management and keep track on it, uh, doing a continuous skill assessment. Now you can use um, a questionnaire where you ask them about their confidence, ask them about their skills in the topic you want to learn them in. Uh, before the uh, sessions and after the sessions so that you can get a report and what was the impact of your uh, training um, measures. And then you would, um, uh, of course, uh, continuously improve uh, the learning formats and report on the impact, which is basically three things. So what is the learning initiative doing towards your uh, company goals? So are there hours back to business generated because you have worked on concrete use cases, for example? Then the second thing is, how could you um, increase the competencies of the people, the skills? And the third thing you should report is uh, on the uh, net promoter score. So how good um, perceived, um, how, how well perceived the participants, the training, and do they think it's helpful also for other employees in your company? To round it up, and then we have some time for Q&A, um, I recommend um, uh, listen to our uh, podcast. This comes uh, uh, bi-weekly. Um, recently just uh, talked to someone from SAP about their automation strategy, but I'm also talking to corporate uh, leaders uh, about automation and automation upskilling. Then um, also feel free to uh, subscribe to uh, the Automation Mac where we uh, have uh, it's uh, 
appearing once a month and has the uh, greatest news and statistics uh, about automation and upskilling, which you could, could see in the first half of the presentations. That's uh, almost everything out of our automation uh, magazine. And then, of course, I would be super happy if you add me in LinkedIn and we can connect um, afterwards. And now I'm super happy for your questions. And one last quote I have for you uh, is your job is safe. Uh, your role is not it's something someone from uh, Adidas uh, said in the IT department and I stole it and I found it really interesting as a quote to end this presentation. I think that's a very excellent quote uh, to end this presentation. And uh, we've been talking a lot around job security in the domain of automation. I think everyone is uh, ver very well aware that the landscape is changing uh, and that the jobs will be around for a while but not in the way that they are shaped as they currently are. Thanks, Nico, for a very um, engaging, very well um, um, presented presentation. I, th I thought it was very, very interesting. And you showed some very good practical advice on, uh, I would say, transforming the way that people operate and not just the traditional, as you mentioned, boring classroom kind of uh, um, style of training. So I think that was very interesting. Good. I saw a couple of questions coming in um, on the um, on the side, so let me project them to the screen. First question is: Could you provide some specific techniques or approaches that companies can use to effectively teach these skills to employees, especially those without a technical background? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So. Basically, the uh, formats um, I showed on one of the slides. So I can really recommend to do it in a blended learning approach um, and not just um, publish uh, the e-learnings in the organizations and, and think that everyone will look into it now. <laughs> um, it's, it's much better to roll it out in a campaign style, to have a very good uh, communication around it, to include the learning and development department and then um, start with um, fixed uh, workshop schedules and in between having the self-learning phases. That's, yeah, that's I think blended learning is also, from my experience, one of the most effective forms uh, because it allows you not to um, um, basically to force people also to attend um, and complete the program because with e-learning, with e what we still see um, in many, many cases is that People say they're going to participate, but in reality, um, they don't fully complete the end of it. Exactly. Yeah, that's also also my experience. Good. Then the next question is, um, let's uh, do the one from Mike. How would we get our organization to be excited and willing to promote upskilling? That's a difficult one. <laughs> mm -hmm. The, uh, I would also uh, split it. It's an excellent question, Mike. Um, I would split it uh, into what we mean by uh, organization. So there's different stakeholders in an organization. Um, if you're talking about the uh, leadership, <laughs> so I would I split it in leadership and um, the the, um, the broader organization. So the the uh, people that would um, do the upskilling for the leadership. Um, I would um, really bound the initiative to the main uh, company goals. So if you really, usually every uh, company has some kind of C-level goals uh, communicated into the organization, and then you should think about how can you contribute to this with an upskilling initiative. And then you also get the backup from the leadership um, for this, and that can be super individual uh, for each um, organization. Um, and then the second uh, group, so if you want to communicate it to the broader employees, so let's say you have the board in from the management because you bound your initiative to the main company goals, then um, it's super important to tell um, a story uh, to the employees to not just say, okay, uh, now do upskilling because we want it. Um, I even saw in some companies, they implemented a new learning management system. And then they said, 
<laughs> okay, now we have a brand new learning management system. You should use it. Everyone should use it now. But it's not a, a, an appealing storyline for um, an employee. You should rather build a story around why it's important to learn that skills for that particular person. For example, showing them, and I have this uh, example of an accountant always, but it's, I think it's a good one, um, showing an accountant that, hey, 50% of your job activities can be already automated if you want to be uh, future-proof, not only in our organization, but in your career, you should really learn about these topics. And that's much more motivating for that, uh, for that person. Absolutely. And I think if you don't show that path, then... Uh... Yeah, just throwing in a new tool is uh, generally not motivating for people at all. Yeah. Good. We have one more question, um, and that is as follows. Considering the diversity of skills and backgrounds in a typical workforce, how can companies tailor their upskilling program to cater to individuals with varying levels of technical expertise? Mm -hmm. So I think this, uh, this refers to more, it's more of the personalization uh, yeah. question, right? Yeah. So, um, of course, uh, a general, um, so if you look into one learning program, let's say you have a cohort based learning program that should train people into developing a, a low code app, then um, you can work with uh, the self learning phases to make sure that they are at the same level when it comes to the live sessions. But uh, of course, you should also uh, make sure that you do not have two fragmented uh, learning groups in one cohort uh, or two fragmented learning groups in one uh, session that you can do with uh, skill assessments. So you ask them before they attend a training, hey, what's your skills? And then you sort them to the right cohort or to the right training program. I do not need to tell someone the basics of uh, um, uh, process excellence if that person works since 20 years in Lean Six Sigma. Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. this person can directly go into developing a technical solution, for example. Absolutely. Nice. Thanks for that. Very good advice. Hope that that answers the, the questions of the participants. Nico, I would like to uh, thank you so much for giving us a very insightful presentation, which is really spot on onto the topic that we are discussing today. Uh, I think a lot of people really liked it and um, uh, it shows by the questions in the comments that it's a very uh, a topic that is, I think, very close to everyone's heart. I also really like your presentation style and the way that you uh, um, promote this. So uh, very um, thank you very much from everyone on behalf of Automation Days for your words of wisdom. And I hope that we can Thank connect you. again soon to discuss this in more detail. Um, so it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Yeah, it was an honor to be here and let's connect on LinkedIn. Absolutely, thanks Nico. Bye. Bye. Good, for everyone else, um, please note that we are already moving towards our last track session of Automation Days Asia. I cannot believe how time is flying by especially if you're having fun, the days really fly by. We have two very gifted speakers. So you could say that we saved the best for last. And in track one, we're gonna to listen to Tim Cortovinas, who is a global keynote speaker and author uh, around this is marketing automation. He's gonna talk about your processes are automated. Why isn't your sales process? On the other track, we're gonna to listen to Thomas Wilk, who is a manager at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC and he is gonna be talking about automations for humans, ideas, how to build an automation operation supporting your human workforce. So again, uh, think uh, you need to make a final choice between the two speakers um, for the last session of Automation Days Asia. Look forward to seeing everyone back after a short break, 15 minutes from now, we're gonna start the final tracks. See you there. <laughs>